Hello. Hi, bienvenue and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for coming uh, to join us today to hear um, Catherine Morris, the Sackler Family Curator for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. She's going to speak to us today about strategies for feminist curating. And I will let my co-curator um, uh, for the Alma Duncan Project uh, give you more of an introduction about Catherine herself. Uh, but meanwhile, I just wanted to say um, welcome to Catherine Morris and to you, the audience, on behalf of the Ottawa Art Gallery. Thank you um, to our main funder who made this uh, visit and lecture possible, the Museum Assistance uh, Program of Canadian Heritage. They contributed substantially to the exhibition. Um, I have a little plug for the catalog here, to our catalog and to the tour of the exhibition as well, as well as to our public programming of which this forms part. So the exhibition uh, Alma, the Life and Art of Alma Duncan from 1917 to 2004 was held at the Ottawa Art Gallery this past October uh, through January of this, this year. It's now on exhibition at the Varley Art Gallery in Markham until May 3rd and it will be opening at the Judith and Alex Norman Art Gallery in Sarnia um, on the 5th of June where it will be on display till August and then it will complete its um, Ontario tour at the Art Gallery of Windsor next April through the summer months of 2016. So I would just like to also thank our funders, um, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Ontario Arts Council, and the City of Ottawa as well. Uh, la conférence se déroulera en anglais, mais si vous voulez poser vos questions en français, ça, vous, ça nous fera plaisir de faire la traduction. And uh, just a quick reminder to just turn off your cell phones, um, if please, uh, that the, it will be recorded, um, and that if you are interested in signing up for uh, notification of our future programming, there's a list at the table at the back. Um, and we do hope that you uh, stick around for a, a, a little bit afterwards to have a, a small reception at the back in this room. So the recovery of the life and work of Alma Duncan was an extensive and rewarding project for myself and my co-curator Jacqueline Meloche. So without further, uh, further ado, I would like to invite Jacqueline to come forward to say more about our guest speaker today. Bon après-midi à tous et à toutes. Je vous remercie pour joindre Catherine Sinclair, la Galerie d'art d'Ottawa, l'Université d'Ottawa et moi-même pour accueillir Catherine Morris, la commissaire du Centre d'art féministe, à, Centre d'art féministe Elizabeth A. Sackler du Musée de Brooklyn. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you. For, uh, thank you all for joining Catherine Sinclair, the Ottawa Art Gallery, the University of Ottawa, and myself for welcoming Catherine Morris, the Sackler Family Curator for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. Morris's ongoing contributions to the celebration and recovery of women artists significantly, significantly influenced the ways in which I contributed to the curation of the Turing exhibition Alma, the life and work of Alma Duncan, 1917 to 2004. Challenged by the questions, what does it mean to recover a woman artist today? Is there still an institutional need to practice feminist art history? And what are the contemporary conditions for a women, art, women, women artist recovery project? Catherine and I look to examples of feminist curatorial practices, such as Catherine Morris's, to inform how we contextualized and politicized Duncan's art in 2014. I was first introduced to Alma Duncan in 2001 and was quickly troubled by her invisibility in Canadian art history. Born in Paris, Ontario in 1917, Duncan established herself in Ottawa in 1943, where she lived until her passing in 2004. The name Alma Duncan, although a somewhat familiar name within the local art community, had earned little national recognition, regardless of her contributions to Canadian film animation, the documentation of the Canadian war effort on the home front, abstraction, landscape drawing, and what I consider a performative archive of Canadian cultural producers in portraits of P.K. Page, Grant Monroe, and Norman McLaren. In 2011, Catherine Sinclair, senior curator of the Ottawa Art Gallery, and I partnered together to bring Duncan out of the vaults and private collections to instigate a conversation about feminist curatorial strategies today. My own interest in a feminist curatorial initiative, although originally inspired by the late Natalie Lipsky of Carleton University in Ottawa, grew out of my early visits to the Elizabeth Sackler Center for Feminist Art at the Brooklyn Museum. In 2007, I had the opportunity to visit the Center's inaugural exhibition, Global Feminisms, the first international exhibition exclusively dedicated to feminist art from 1990 to present. 
Although thrilled by such a comprehensive celebration of women artists, it, is also a shocking, it was also shocking that this exhibition was the first of its kind. In keeping with its mandate to revolutionize the ways in which feminist art is presented and ultimately canonized, the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center has become an important exhibition and educational space in which the definition of art is continually being challenged and reinvented to become more inclusive. In 2009, Catherine Morris has, since 2009, Catherine Morris has curated a number of exhibitions for the Elizabeth A. Sackler Center, including the award-winning exhibition Materializing, Six Years, Lucy R. Lepard, and The Emergence of Conceptual Art, co-curated with Vincent Bonnet. Twice Militant, Lorraine Hansberry's Letters to the Latter, Between the Door and the Street, a performance initiated by Suzanne Lacey, Work by Hand, Hidden Labor and Historical Quilts, <laughs> Kathy Colwitz, Prints from the War and Death, Portfolios, Rachel Kneebone, Regarding Rodin, Newspapers Fiction, The New York Journalism of Juana, Juna. Juna Barnes, 1913 to 1919, Matthew Buckingham, The Spirit of the Letter, Lorna Simpson, Gathered, Sam Tom Taylor, Ghosts, Kiki Smith, Sojourn and Healing the Wounds of War, the Brooklyn Sanitary F uh, Fair of 1864. In addition, she was the in-house curator of Eva Hess, Spectres, 1960, and Seductive Subversion, Women Pop Artists, 1958 to 1968. Before joining the Center for Feminist Art, Morris was an independent curator. Among some of the projects she organized are Decoys, Complexes, and Triggers, Women in Land Art in the 1970s at the Sculpture Center in Long Island City, Nine Evenings, Reconsidered, Art, Theater, and Engineering, 1966 for the MIT List Visual Art Center, and Gloria, Another Look at Feminist Art of the 1970s at White Columns in New York City. From 2004 until 2009, she was adjunct curator of curator art at the Philip Burke Museum of Art in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where she curated exhibitions of Josiah McKelney, McElney. <laughs> I practiced, I did, Lucy Gunning and Cameron Martin. And in 2004, she received a Penny McCall Foundation Award for independent curating and writing. A prominent and celebrated voice in feminist curatorial practices today, Morris's contributions to the recovery of women artists is extensive, and for this reason, a necessary voice to hear in the context of the recovery of Alma Duncan. Therefore, on behalf of myself, the Ottawa Art Gallery, and the Department of Visual Arts at the University of Ottawa, I would like to thank Catherine Morris for being here today to share with us her stakes in feminist curatorial practices and research. Alors, au nom de moi-même, la Galerie d'art d'Ottawa et le département d'art visuel de l'Université d'Ottawa, je tiens à remercier Catherine Morris d'être ici aujourd'hui pour partager avec nous ses recherches au Centre d'art féministe Elizabeth A. Sackler au Musée de Brooklyn. So, ladies and gentlemen, uh, please join me in welcoming Catherine Morris. Hi. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Jacqueline, for inviting me. Thank you to the university and to the art gallery for having me as well. Um, it's, I've said several times today, it's a, it's a great opportunity to be invited to sort of talk about um, what I do. Um, oh. um, because, like many of us who spend so much time thinking about what we have to do today, having the opportunity to think sort of more largely about the conceptual structure that I work within, which is unusual, um, is a great opportunity. So thank you, and thank you all for being here to listen to me. Um, I also am very pleased about the size of this room. It feels sort of manageable, so I'm looking forward to having some questions or conversations in a few minutes. Um, really what I want to do is talk about some of the shows that I've curated and talk about the different ways in which they speak to the way that curating feminism curating from a feminist perspective, curating through the lens of feminism, has developed for me as a curator over the last six years that I've worked at the Brooklyn Museum, but also before that, I won't talk about shows before that, but just in the process of thinking about how feminism functions for me, again, as a methodology. It's one of the first things that became important to me uh, when I arrived at the Sackler Center. Maybe we could have the first slide. Thank you. I'll be doing that a lot because I don't have a clicker. Um, 
because one of the first things that I decided when I came to the Sackler Center as the curator six years ago was my priority. One of my priorities was not to convince anybody that they should be a feminist, to ask anybody if they're a feminist, to find the words to attach to the word feminist, to make somebody feel comfortable with the word feminist. My priority was to show that if you're looking at visual culture in 2015, you've been impacted by feminism. So whatever your position in relationship to the word in terms of your own personal politics, which I'm you know, perfectly happy to talk about, but my position is more engaged in thinking about the fact that for me, and for many people, and I'll start with a couple of quotes in a second, feminism is one of the most important movements or one of the most important political, social, cultural constructs which has affected the way we look at almost anything today. And what does that mean? What does that mean to me? What does that mean to artists? What does that mean in looking at different historical periods? Um, How do we do that? How do we play with that notion and make feminism as a methodology viable for the long term? You know, there's a real very important part of my job. I want my job. I want my job to be around for a while. So for me, the idea also of how feminism plays into the future, how you sort of um, work with the term in a way that maintains its viability, maintains its currency, is very important. So one of the first things that I wanted to make sure people understood about the Sackler Center was that it is not a ghetto <laughs> for women artists. It is not a back door into the rest of the institution for women artists. It is a place that, by, strictly by virtue of the fact that it exists, in an institution, a historical collecting 19th century model of an institution, it changes the way everything else in, this, in that place looks. It's not its own discrete place. It is a thing that makes everything else different. And um, for me, the idea of playing with that has been a sheer pleasure. I often get asked what my, speciali- my specialization, and as, a, as you just heard from the introduction, it is primarily contemporary art. It's, in fact, primarily sort of conceptual practices of the 60s and 70s, but really what I like to say is I'm kind of um, uh, a dilettante (laughs) because I feel like what the Brooklyn Museum offers me is the opportunity to look at history. I personally would have been a lot less interested in being the curator of a standalone feminist institution. Part of the reason that it fascinates me is because of the context that a place like the Brooklyn Museum offers. Um, And so that's very important to me, and you'll hopefully see that as I talk about some of the shows that I've curated. Um, Whenever I do a talk like this, I like to start with three different quotes that um, I was just reading yesterday and suddenly feel like they're a little bit dated, so I think I may have to come up with some new ones. But in the interim, um, three quotes that I feel like sort of offer um, a couple of voices to reinforce what I've just said. Um, The first is from um, an article that Holland Cotter published in 2007. Holland Cotter, one of the primary critics of the New York Times, 2007 being an important year for feminist curating. It was the year that the WAC show came to New York. It was the year that Global Feminisms and the Sackler Center opened in New York. It was a moment at which it was also the year that there was a very important conference at MoMA as they started off their Modern Women Project. Um, It was a moment in which feminism suddenly really... um, flared in a way that it does, um, and people were taking notice of it. And in his article, a review of some of the um, events around that period in March 2007, um, Holland wrote, Feminist art, which emerged in the 1960s with the women's movement, is the formative art of the last four decades. Scan the most innovative work by both men and women done during that time, and you'll find feminism's activist, expansionist, pluralistic trace. Without its identity-based art, crafts-derived art, performance art, and much political art would not exist in the, without it, all of those things would not exist in the form that it does, if it existed at all. Much of what we call postmodern art has feminism, has feminist art at its source. And I would agree wholeheartedly with everything that, that Cotter um, posits in that statement. Um, The second quote is by uh, another colleague of mine, a great curator, Camille Morneau, who's just um, uh, opened the second venue of her Nikki de saint exhibition at the um, Bilbao, the Guggenheim Bilbao, which is um, an exhibition I haven't seen but is getting a lot of great attention. In 2009, she was the curator at the Pompidou, 
and she um, spearheaded a project there called Elle at Centre Pompidou, which many of you know, which was the first time an institution of its sort um, <coughs> undertook the project to rehang its permanent collection galleries as all, in all, as all women artists. Quite a... Um, thank you. <laughs> um, a great curatorial idea. A great curatorial idea for me always reflects two things. It reflects um, a sort of initial basic simplicity, a clarity. Let's rehang the collection as women. <laughs> but then has an amazing amount of um, opportunities for discussion and depth within that simple sort of easy to sort of contextualize um, notion. And um, this is a quote from her essay in the catalog for, um, for that exhibition. People might criticize the extremism of the 100% women figure and the exclusion of men that it dictates, just as others might comment on the tardiness of this gesture or might, de or might denounce the ghettoization implied by a gender-based exhibition. We considered all these pertinent criticisms before adopting what seemed to us to be the fairest compromise, namely not to worry ourselves about it. Um, again, what I think that speaks to is this notion there are so many conversations that we could have in this room about what it means to parse the difference between um, curating as a feminist, what it means to have women-only institution, what it means to sort of decide on the parameters of um, how we can tell these various stories or how we can have these various conversations. And at the end of the day, my feeling about most of them is that they're still valid, all of them. <laughs> There's very few models or methods around revisioning, re-examining, re-presenting um, work by women artists that aren't, don't still maintain some level of, of viability. Having said that, I would also very gladly have a conversation about the problems that I have about ideas of only women shows, shows that are just women artists. That's a different, that's part of a conversation that gets folded into this, but, and is more complicated for me, honestly, which is part of why this is interesting, because we all have, there's many, many different opinions, and they change. Um, the last quote is just a brief one that I love from a great artist named Emily, Ro Emily Roysden, who some of you may know. She was one of the founders of a group called LTTR, Lesbians to the Rescue, and one of the things that she said that I think encapsulates what I hope the Sackler Center does um, is that she said about the group LTTR, we are not protesting what we don't want, we are performing what we want. And I think that speaks also to um, what I hope current day feminism is able to accomplish, is um, uh, not only sort of pointing out and demanding the writing of inequities, um, but also pointing to the things that have changed and are changing and that we want living in the world that we want to live in. Um, so, along that line, um, the Sackler Center for Feminist Art was founded in, oh, this is going to be embarrassing if I can't open this, okay. Um, opened in 2007. It was founded, it was the brainchild of two people, Elizabeth Sackler, and Arnold Lehman, the current director of the Brooklyn Museum. Elizabeth Sackler is a philanthropist. She likes to call herself an activist with means. Um, <laughs> and she came from a family that certainly modeled um, patronage in the arts. Many of you probably have seen the name Sackler on any number of galleries and museums all over the world. And in addition to growing up in a family that built museums, built wings of museums, built programmatic arms of museums. She was also a very much what she would call a child of the 60s and was very engaged herself in political action. She, in the late 80s, met Judy Chicago um, and learned of the long and illustrious or quite dubious history of trying to find a home for Judy Chicago's dinner party and committed herself to finding a permanent home for the dinner party. Most of you, I'm sure, know the work of art. It will soon have its 40th anniversary. We are officially in the period of the making of the dinner party 40 years ago. Started in 1974, finished in 1979, 78, 
and um, an important and controversial and dynamic and still very um, engaged work of art by Judy Chicago and a large number of people who helped her realize this enormous reclamation project. <coughs> In trying to decide where to house the piece, Judy and Elizabeth had various conversations about what might be the proper home for it. At one point, they met each other. They both have houses. They both live in Santa Fe part of the year. Judy lives in New Mexico year-round. And um, they at one point talked about building a, a standalone building in the mountains outside of Santa Fe where you had to ride horses to get there that would light up at night. I mean, they had these sort of all these fantastical notions about what the kind of location for a work like this could be. Um, again, I would not be the curator there if that was the case. Um, <laughs> instead, surprisingly, as many of you know, also probably know, Judy Chicago is not an artist just associated with New York in many ways. And in fact, New York for Judy Chicago is the site of some of, I think, her most painful encounters with the art world. Um, but surprisingly, when Elizabeth asked her, okay, where do you want this to go to the East Coast? Do you want it to go to New York City? And she said, yes, yeah, she wanted it, in fact, to be in New York and not be in California, which is where she's much more typically um, associated geographically. And the Brooklyn Museum became a great venue for um, the Sackler Center. Part of our history with the Chicago piece is, I think, importantly that during the course of its long tour after it was made, some of you may have even seen it during that tour, it went to various cities throughout the United States. It came to Canada, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I should know that. And also to Europe, but as you may remember, most of the places where the dinner party was shown when it was toured were not museums. They were shown, it was shown in local organizations, largely found and funded by local women's groups who wanted to bring the piece to their cities. So it has a sort of really interesting history that way. Two art museums welcomed the dinner party, and the Brooklyn Museum was one of them. So for us, that was an important history to kind of um, acknowledge and made it um, particularly important for us to bring it back and have a space, a site for it as a permanent home. So it's been interesting for me as a curator to, um, and I'll try not to go off on a tangent on this too much. Um, I came of age very much engaged in thinking about feminism and very much engaged in the problematics of the dinner party. So it's been a very interesting process for me to work with this work of art for the last six years and see it become a historical object and to see particularly younger women interact with it very differently than I feel like people of my generation did. And so it's been a real thrill for me to sort of have the experience of watching an object like this become canonized and become part of a dialogue that different people in different periods of time see differently. And Judy's project, if nothing else, was about the canon. It was about rewriting the history that she had been taught. So very much a canon canonical rethinking, and for that reason, very much a part, a very baseline part of, of what it means to think about writing art history or curating art history as a feminist. Um, in an essay for the WAC catalog um, that some of you, I'm sure, saw, um, which was recently posted online on MOCA's website, LA MOCA. Helen Molesworth, um, an essay by Helen Molesworth, who's now the chief curator there. I recommend the article if you want to take a look for it. She um, wrote two suggestions um, for that, feminist, that a feminist methodology offers as gestures of um, curating. So I'd just like to mention these two before we start talking about shows. Um, the first is that um, feminist methodology is or can be a challenge to the persistent organization of the world through the category of gender that consistently privileges men. That's a pretty sort of, I think, bare bones, <coughs> basic um, definition of what that means. The second is, the second is that feminism privileges self-criticality as opposed to self-expression, per se, and in political <laughs> aesthetics and in political aesthetics and intellectual practices. This is important to me, and we'll get into this as we talk about the shows that I've curated. This is important to me, this point, because I think that also is really very much points to one of the ways in which, to reinforce Holland Cotter's point, feminism has impacted the last 50 years of art making in really significant ways, and that is the idea of personal politics, the idea of narrative as legitimate for art making, as a legitimate source for art making that is... Um, Many of the ideas that come out of conceptual art in the 60s and 70s, I think, are driven by feminist thinking, and I think that is a, a fact that has been not so much acknowledged in some ways, and one of the shows that I'll talk about really tried to take that on. 
Um, can we have the next slides, please? But before I get to that, I'll just pr briefly mention um, a couple of shows that I've done that I think fall into the category of revisionist history, that really fall into the most traditional, if there is a traditional, um, model for feminist curating that comes from the 60s and 70s, that comes from Judy Chicago. It is, let's reinsert the women into the canon that were written out of it. That, I think, is the baseline kind of activity that um, feminist curating has um, operated on, and it's a very important one and one that I fully engage with um, over the last um, several decades. So in thinking about that, one of the first shows that I worked on at the Sackler Center, it is not a show I curated, it was curated, um, uh, uh, came out of Philadelphia, but we revisioned it and we worked it for our space at the Brooklyn Museum, um, was an exhibition called Seductive Subversion, Women Pop Artists, 1958 to 1968. Um, two installation shots here and an example of our webpage, which I'll just mention briefly in a second. And what was important about this show was revisionist history is still ongoing. Reclamation history is necessary. Um, how many people, when they're, meant, when they're asked to name pop artists, can think of women? It's a very unusual, it's a hard question. And to me, it's an interesting question about why it's so hard. And part of the reason I think, excuse me, is that date. I think pop art emerges 1958 to 1968. I think that if pop art had emerged 1960 to 1970, we would have a very different understanding of what the canonical understanding of pop art was. I think the fact that it really, pop art had sort of solidified its um, basic tenets, its basic sort of breadth by 1968 meant that women were not written into that history. So this was an important, one of the first important multiple sort of larger thematic group shows for, that I wanted to undertake at the Brooklyn Museum for just that reason. I think it's a very straightforward, again, um, revisionist history. There's some great pieces here, as you can see. There's this great Carissa piece, a um, neon piece from, of the Hercent from Times Square that was in another example of what I would call feminist curating that had been sitting in the storage vaults in the Brooklyn Museum for 30 years, <laughs> broken. <laughs> and we had never had the money to fix it and to bring it out. Nobody was interested. And for this exhibition, for me, the opportunity to sort of reclaim a work from our own collection and bring it out onto public view for the first time in decades was, if nothing else, that was worth doing the show <laughs> to a large degree. Um, I'll just mention briefly um, one of the other things that we did for this show, which was very important at the time, um, 2011, eons ago, in a very different world of um, web-based living. Um, in 2011, uh, there was a lot of debate in the air, a lot of heated argument. Many of you will remember in academic circles about the validity of Wikipedia. I think that argument has been largely put to rest in some ways. <laughs> they have won. But um, <laughs> So you walk into an exhibition. You walk into an exhibition of a lot of women artists, a lot of artists whose names are not necessarily immediately recognizable. Some of them were, a lot weren't. As a curator, the constant struggle is how much verbiage do we put on the walls? How many labels do we want people to read? How much time do we want people to read labels and how much time do we want them to be looking at the art? And in a case like this, you have two things you want to make, two points you want to make. You want to give biography, you want to let, these, you want to let the public know who these people are if they don't know, and you want to say something about the object they're standing in front of. We decided to make the labels on the walls about the object that people were standing in front of and looking at. And we decided to take on what we called the Wikipop project, um, which was we went through Wikipedia and found, of course, that most of the women in the show did not have Wikipedia pages, or if they did, they were very inaccurate or very minimal, or just those thumbnail um, pages that exist. And we re-did, made, organized Wikipedia pages for each of them. Um, doing it on Wikipedia, in spite of the love-hate relationship that many of us have with it, was also important because it's the site where people go. <laughs> And that in and of itself seems to be a gesture that's about inclusiveness. It also is a gesture that's about the fact that these pages live. People will add to them. They will be edited. They will move in relationship to new work that's being done. And that's important, too, as opposed to a um, standalone private web website on our museum. This felt much more dynamic. Um, and there was something else about that that I was going to say. I can't remember what it was. Um, 
So, and that was very successful. It was, we had iPads in the galleries at several stations so people could look at the Wikipedia entries in the galleries if they wanted to. That was hugely successful. It's also interesting now to wonder how much it was successful just because iPads were kind of new. <laughs> and people were having fun with the iPads. But we have a lot of statistics that get rolled out, and every time they talk about the success of the project, I always kind of have that in the back of my head. Um, thank you, yes. <laughs> so the next free appropriate, the next sort of revisionist project we did, man, do you have four hours? <laughs> is um, this project, which is very important to me, a co-curated project that I did with Vincent Bonin, who some of you may know is an independent curator who um, lives in Montreal. And... Um, he and I, for years, I met him when I worked on a project uh, having to do with a group of performances in New York called um, Nine Evenings. And I went, came up to Montreal to do research at the Langlois Foundation and met him there. And we were kind of nerdy art historians, and we were talking always about this book. Do any of you, most of you know this book, heard of this book? Six Years, The Dematerialization of the Art Object. <coughs> I usually go through the process, but since I don't have time, of reading the title of the book, which is 67 words long. So this is the entire title of the book. Um, this is a kind of Bible, if you will, that many of us, many of us of a certain generation carried around under our arms and loved. Um, it is Lucy Lepard's book about the emergence of the conceptual period between 1966 and 1972. It is basically an annotated bibliography of events laid out chronologically a course of six years of things that she thought were important. She wasn't, as an art critic, claiming that they were conceptual art yet. She was trying to define what she was seeing going on amongst her peers in studios, in exhibitions all over the world. And as a result, she came out with this compendium, which, as I said, is an amazing document, and I recommend buying it. It has been republished by Berkeley, so it's available. And it's just, that's what it is. It's just a list of stuff, six years' worth of stuff that went on in the art world that couldn't easily be quantifiably categorized. So that's why she says, uh, it's a bibliography into which are inserted fragmented texts, artworks, documents, interviews, and symposia arranged chronologically and focused on so-called conceptual or information or idea art with mentions of such vaguely designated areas as minimal, anti-form, systems, earth, or process art. This was a critic trying to grapple with what she was seeing happening that hadn't been defined yet. And it is the document, I would argue, others wouldn't necessarily, it is the document that largely defines conceptual art as we understand its history today, that emergent moment of its history. And for me, and Vincent, who came up with this idea that was sort of a parlor game, we should make a show out of this book. At one point, Lucy calls this book the best show she ever curated. There's another very important show that we document. Her first show she ever curated is the show that opens up this exhibition, and she called that show the best piece of criticism she ever wrote. So she is somebody who's playing with the ideas that become very much a part of the conversation we are still having about what constitutes an art practice, what constitutes the practice of criticism, what constitutes the practice of curating. How do all these things infiltrate, infect, and become um, part of each other. So Vincent and I came up with this crazy idea that we're going to do a show about this book before I started working at the Sackler Center. Lucy Lepard, as many of you know, was a very famous, most famous, probably as a feminist critic in the 70s. She is a voice that people still constantly refer to for the clarity of her thinking, for the synthesis of her observations. She's a great critic. And she was a woman who really took on the idea of feminism um, at a very early point. This book predates that. So Vincent and I had this conversation about doing this show for years. And then I ended up at the Sackler Center. And I said, I want to do this show, but this isn't a feminist show. This is about the sh this. Anybody would say that this is about what Lucy was doing before she was a feminist. So why would we do this show? And for me, it became exactly the point of what it means to curate from a feminist perspective. <laughs> because, in fact, what Lucy Lepard did as a woman as a critic, was defined all of this art by all of these people, some of whom, Dorothea Rockburn, um, are very well-known feminist artists. Others, Michael Snow, uh, Lawrence Wiener, you know, people who are not feminist. I would never make a claim for them being feminist, but Lucy Lepard had a big part in defining how we understand that. So for me, that's feminist. And that was more than enough reason to do a show like this, was to recast the emergence of conceptual art 
as part of the dialogue that was emerging around feminism at exactly the same time. The next one, please. Okay, I gotta speed up. The next show that I just want to mention briefly because it goes back to this earlier concept that I said of the dilettante, which is um, the Sackler Center. You may have gotten a sense of the space now. We have basically two galleries that situate itself around um, the um, dinner party. Is an opportunity to look at everything else in the Brooklyn Museum, and this is one example of way of looking at everything else in the Brooklyn Museum. And one of the ones, one of the things that I wanted to look at or that we decided to look at was this amazing, extraordinary history that we have of quilts in our collection. Again, no claims for the makers of these quilts as being feminist, per se, but very much a claim for our understanding and the way that we look at quilt making today having been impacted by feminists. There, it was a fa it's a fascinating history, and some of you probably know it more than I do. It's whatever I talk about this show in particular, I always look in the room and want to ask people, are there quilt makers here? Because if there are, it makes me nervous. Um, the Brooklyn Museum has an extraordinary quilt collection. It has shown the quilt collection two or three times, the last time in the 1960s. So the history, the institutional history of showing quilts in the museum is also fascinating in relationship to the way the quilts were perceived. We have incredible quilts. This is an extraordinary quilt from 1795 that is probably Irish, but also could have been made in the United States by an Irish maker. And it is, it, I wish I had a picture of it. It's just Amazing. And then we have more traditional quilts, these sort of more federal style quilts. Um, and we move around the room historically into shaker, I mean, um, yeah, more um, Amish quilts and crazy quilts. And for me, the idea was to talk about the myth, the myth of quilt making. There are so many myths of quilt making that fall into the context of what it means to be feminist. Most quilt makers are anonymous. They didn't intend to be anonymous, but that's sort of the sort of accepted. Um, truth about these objects. Most quilts were not, most quilts were made by one person. There's this other idea that quilts are made by groups of people. Quilts are often put together by groups of people in the port and when the quilt top is actually attached to the bottom of the quilt. But most of these quilts were designed and executed, often with help, by one individual maker. And that's also points to the kind of discussion about how women made things and how they use their creative energy to make things over time. And many other um, sort of myths about quilt making, which were really interesting um, in relationship to our own um, colonial history and how, um, and how we show them. How quilts get shown on walls now as art when they never were before, which is part of the reason we put some of them horizontally so that they could be shown as they were designed. Uh, trying to move past here. Oh my God. Next one, please. Now we'll jump into the performative. One of the other ways that I'm really interested in having the Sackler Center move out into the institution, that seductive subversion pop show, by the way, was in more than just the Sackler Center. So we're trying to sort of take over more space in the museum as much as possible. In this case, we actually took over the streets of Brooklyn in a project we did with Suzanne Lacey, who some of you may know, very influential and um, important thinker around performative practices beginning in the 1970s, and to this day, very involved in making these sort of large-scale projects that include huge communities of people contributing to the outcome of a performance. So that's why it's called a, um, actually I should rewrite that, that's wrong. She, she likes to present it as a project instigated by Suzanne Lacey, because she does not see herself as an artist in the way that it's, I'm sorry, erroneously written here. <laughs> And this is a project that was months in the making. We worked with a great group in, in New York called a Creative Time to produce this. Um, Suzanne, who's based in California, came and spent months in New York developing conversations with communities of people to come together on one block in Brooklyn <coughs> to talk. She spent months organizing hundreds of people from various local community grassroots ad hoc organizations to come together and just have conversations on stoops in Brooklyn to talk about feminism. The idea of the stoop was really important. Stoop culture <laughs> in Brooklyn, in New York, is a very important thing. It's that space that's sort of outside your front door, so it is officially public space, but it's still space on the street where you live, where you know your neighbors, so it still has this sort of sense of intimacy and this sense of local community. At the same time, it's something, it's that space where you're overheard by your neighbors if you're talking, you're gossiping. So it's this sort of loaded kind of notion that Suzanne wanted to play with so that 
Each stoop had a group of five, six women, not only women, men, various people. They were all designated by this um, yellow scarf. And they just sat and talked about their issues and their subjects and the questions that had come up with, they had come up with over months of conversation together and in their groups. And people could come and just listen. They were not amplified, so you kind of had to work at listening in some way. You had sort of, and then you could also just experience this kind of culture of discussion. And um, so that was, and that happened in October of 2013, and that was a kind of remarkable experience to just see hundreds of people that would want to just come out and listen to people talking on stoops about something. And um, so that was quite extraordinary. Could we have the next one, please? Uh, we don't have to talk about this very long, except I want to say that, you know, one of the things I knew I was going to have to do when I came to the Brooklyn Museum was a Judy Chicago show. And in thinking about what that show would look like, we decide, I decided I wanted to do a show that was about the work before the dinner party, the work that sort of ends on the dinner party in our space. And in, to do that, we got to really reclaim a lot of history and really talk about a lot of Judy's history as a minimal sculptor, which a lot of people don't know she did. A minimal sculptor who did things that drove all of her male teachers mad, like paint minimalism, these sort of pastel -y sorts of hues that drove everybody insane because that was what she wanted to do. So this was a great show because it really showed the complexity and the way in which Judy Chicago's minimalism, these are called Pasadena lifesavers, um, played into the dinner party um, and began to be seen as sort of um, essentialism or ideas of central core imagery, the way that they become much more overt in later work, how they sort of appear here. You could have the next slide. And part of that, what we also did for that show was also redo one of Judy's major um, ongoing projects, which was working in pyrotechnics, which a lot of people don't know that Judy Chicago did. Judy Chicago went to school to learn how to um, do auto body painting. She went to school to learn how to um, work with um, acrylics and plastics, the way they do on um, surfboards. And she went to pyrotechnic school. So in addition to knowing the dinner party and her then also going to school and learning about China paint, China paint, China plate painting. Um, we also restaged one of Judy Chicago's ambitious dreams, which was to do one of these large butterfly um, pyrotechnic pieces in Prospect Park. So another example of, um, of partnering with another local institution, in this case Prospect Park, and to sort of re and to revive this idea of the butterfly, which as we know is very sort of central, if you will, to Judy Chicago's practice. And that was quite an event as well. That was just over a year ago. Now, in the next slide, I'd like to talk just briefly about a show that just closed two weeks ago that's very important, I think, in terms of talking about feminist curating. This is a show by, of an artist named Judith Scott. The show is called Bound and Unbound. I learned about Judith Scott's work um, by seeing it at art fairs, mostly. Matthew Higgs, my co-curator on the show, who's the director of White Columns in New York, would bring Judith Scott's work to art fairs, and I fell in love with it because it had so many relationships to practices that you can see in any studio in Brooklyn. This sort of idea of found objects, the idea of, um, of non-traditional materials, which is you know, very linked to feminist practices, the ideas of um, sort of anthropomorphizing and thinking about sculpture as additive. Um, so lots of stuff going on that I just thought spoke to a lot of what I was seeing in studios in the city. Um, Judith Scott is an unusual narrative. Judith Scott is an artist who was born with Down syndrome. Judith Scott was born in 1943. In, with Down syndrome, she was largely deaf and mute. She was institutionalized for 35 years in Ohio before her sister, her twin sister, regained guardianship of her and brought her to a place in Cali Oakland, California called Creative Growth, where after months of sitting in a studio and doing nothing, she started one day making these incredible sculptural objects and continued <coughs> to make them every day until she died 15 years later producing a body of over 200 works of art which are remarkable in their complexity, in their sophistication, in their extraordinary presence, and in the, for me, the complexity of the opportunity that Judith Scott offers us to talk about what narrative means, what biography means. Going back to the personal is political. One of the most important things feminism adds to the canon is that idea of biography and narrative. Judith Scott is an artist who makes us question how we deal with that narrative. Her work is abstract, does not invite a discussion of her personal biography, and yet we're fascinated by it and want to talk about it. And for me, as a curator, it's a very difficult position 
to figure out how you balance those things. And it's a feminist position to think about how you introduce and canonize a person who didn't have any interest in that at all. Judith Scott worked on her pieces for months on end. She was finished with the work. She did not speak. When she was finished making a work, she would often do a gesture like this, and the work would go away, and she never looked at it again. She was primarily focused on making an object. She knew when she was finished, which any of you in this room who are an artist know that that's one of the most significant parts of being an artist is knowing when something's done. Um, but she didn't, have any, she didn't have any interest in the way something was presented. We don't know which way is up or down. We don't know why she did what she did. Matthew Higgs, my co-creator, doesn't even like to call it sculpture. But all of these issues become a very important part of a curatorial process of thinking about who gets included. Who gets to be called an outsider? Judith Scott was not an outsider. She worked in a studio environment for 15 years every day with other artists with disabilities making art. She was very much a part of an art community. But the conversations that we all typically have around work that is outsider or insider, to me, fits very much within the context of women artists who are often struggling with this idea of being an outsider. So that was a show that just closed two weeks ago, and we'll have to say was very... Um, important to me because it really raised a lot of important questions about what it meant to curate from a perspective that allows for focusing on the work, but then also talking about the voice and the context of the maker, the culture of the maker. The next show that we're installing, I'm installing next week when I go back, <laughs> is um, an exhibition by an artist which is much more overtly political and much more straightforwardly feminist, and that is the work of an artist named Zanelli Muholi who is from Johannesburg, South Africa, who was born, who was 42 years old, so she was born under the apartheid regime and has become, has come of age as an artist largely exclusively in the post-apartheid era in South Africa. And her project has been, this project, which is her primary project, has been since 2007 um, to make this body of work called Faces and Phases. And it is a documentary project of her LGBTI community in South Africa, black South African lesbians and trans men who um, are out and open within a context of a country that is one of the few countries in the world to have legalized marriage, gay marriage, and adoption rights and other sort of significant legal um, precedents in place on the one hand, but at the same time living within a culture that has extraordinary amounts of violence against people who are queer, and um, particularly the for lesbians, the horrible experience of what's called restorative rape. Um, so Zanelli has made a project over the course of the last seven or eight or nine years documenting her community, the black African lesbian community, as she sees it in a context that is both defiant and proud and beautiful. And her photography falls into the context of the whole tradition of portrait photography in Africa, but in South Africa in particular, which is quite extraordinary. So it's a show we're very excited about presenting. And um, we'll be installing next week. Zanelli calls herself um, a visual activist. That is the way that she defines her practice more than being an artist per se. But she is also an extraordinary photographer. I don't even know if I should talk about this. Then we're doing a project about agitprop. Does everybody know what agitprop is? Agitprop is a term that um, developed in the Russian Revolution, so almost 100 years ago, 1917. And it is work that combines the idea of agitation and propaganda, so agitprop. And artists have engaged in agitprop, I would guess, forever. But the term is about 100 years old and grows out of, as I said, largely the Soviet Revolution. Um, but it is work, artwork that is made specifically to promote social change. It is art that is specifically designed to try and change someone's mind or to specifically try and engage with someone in a political conversation. So we're doing a show on the history of agitprop. We are, um, we being the entire Sackler Center staff, there are four of us, we have formed a collective. I am the oldest member. Um, and we are doing this as a group, for, form of collaboration and curation, which has been a lot of fun. And we are developing five historical groups of agitprop, five examples of historical agitprop, um, and putting those up. 
just seeing if I can find. So we have women as subjects and makers of Soviet agitprop. We have the visual rhetoric, the rhetoric of British suffragists. We have the NAACP's cultural campaign against lynching. We have the circulation of Tina Modetti's Mexican photographs in the socialist press. And we have the living newspaper productions of the Federal Theater Project, a branch of the WPA. So we have five historical moments of agitprop that we're putting up in the gallery. We're then inviting 20 artists to put up their work that relates to it. We're then inviting them to invite an artist to put up work that relates to it. We're then inviting them to invite somebody to put up work that relates to it. So it's an ongoing project that will last a while and will culminate in a kind of, we're assuming, kind of crazy installation of multiple generations and multiple voices all devoted to some reference to this idea of what it means to make um, agitational visual works of art, including um, Yoko Ono, who's participating, and Dred Scott, for example. Okay. Okay, we're not going to do this. I could talk forever. We'll go on. And another one. And another one. Those three slides that I just showed were exhibitions that we do in our smaller galleries, which are mostly historical and relate to people who appear on the dinner party. We'll go on to, we won't do this one either. Or that one. I redid this project, this presentation for, for today, so you are my guinea pigs and I apologize for, for going on for so long. I want to close by just talking about um, our 10th anniversary, which is coming up in 2017. And for the 10th anniversary, I wanted to take this idea, again, of the Sackler Center being more than just a discrete, removed thing in the Brooklyn Museum, and I wanted to go out into the entire institution. And I have luckily gotten support <laughs> to do this by the institution. And so for the, 20th, the 10th anniversary in 2017, we are looking at the entire Brooklyn Museum through the lens of feminist methodology. And um, I have up this picture of Judy Chicago's dinner party just because it really does start, again, with this idea of revisionist history. But for the 20th anniversary, um, we'll be looking at a wide variety of practices and opportunities and projects throughout the entire institution. So I encourage you to come. This is that quote that I started with from um, um, Camille Morneau about the L, where they rehung the Centre Pompidou's collection, women artists, this is taking it to another, I hate that expression, this is pushing that even further. It's in a historical institution. We are doing things from a feminist lens, so there'll be, we are not expecting this to be all women artists at all. This is not about, in fact, getting the women out of storage. This is about the fact of thinking about how any um, collection in the Brooklyn Museum has been infected by the way people understand looking at art now because of feminism. Um, we'll do the next slide, thanks. So, for example, one of the things we're doing, this is a beautiful Nancy Elizabeth Prophet sculpture in its pre-Terry um, Carbone, our American curator, would be dying right now that I'm showing this slide. This is the work that was acquired in the last six or eight months. It has been restored and is now on a new base and has been um, amazingly restored. But um, this is an example of what we might do. One of the things we're going to do is throughout the institution is do different labels. You know, one of the things that feminism also offers us is the question of critiquing what we're assuming as the institutional voice. Whose voice is writing those labels? Who's deciding what information goes onto a label and what information doesn't go onto a label? So one of the very simple things that we're going to do is just write multiple labels. So Nancy Elizabeth Prophet identified as a Native American, because she was, partially, and she would sometimes talk about her work in that context. So let's write that label, if that's what we're doing. Um, Nancy Elizabeth Prophet also identified as an African American. So what does that mean in terms of writing a label? How would that label look different in context in 2015 to another label? Um, that idea of the woman sculptor, how does that function in relationship to an artist who was primarily completely written out of history, struggled desperately in poverty for years on end, went at the same time to RISD and had an amazing opportunity and lived in Paris and sort of did the traditional things that artists do, but at the same time always did it to the point where she was on the verge of complete um, and utter poverty. Um, so what does that mean? And then just what would it mean to write about her as a sculptor? Mm. So that's one example of something we'll do throughout the institution, picking different works of art across collections to think about how we might recontextualize things as simply as that. And then within our collections, we'll be do specific exhibitions. We will be doing large um, temporary exhibitions, but I'm really excited about the collections aspect of this. So for instance, um, in the Egyptian department, um, 
the show that the curator there has recommended, has suggested is called Die Like a Man. Because apparently, and I hope I get this right, if there's any Egyptologists here, please correct me. Um, and he just presented this last week. So apparently in order to get into the afterlife, women could enter the afterlife in many Egyptian mythologies, but you had to be a man first. So the way that they would do that would be that they would make coffins uh, in the gender that sort of made you able to transition into the afterlife. And this is apparently something that was known in Egyptology but was never really focused on until the last 20 years when more sort of women who were involved in feminism or more people who were thinking about gender identity in relationship to objects sort of brought this forward. So that's a very clear idea of feminist curating. Um, in the case of our African curator, he has been talking about also the idea of gender fluidity. I will, one of my closing remarks will be that I think that one of the most important moment, things that is happening in the world that we find ourselves living in is the idea that gender is not a binary, is the idea that gender is a fluid um, experience that is being redefined constantly. And um, cultures like, in certain cultures in Africa, that has always been part of a discussion about how one identifies and how one dresses and how one sort of presents themselves in matrilineal culture, matrilineal cultures, but also in other um, patriarchal cultures. So this is an example of a spirit mask that is made by, to be a woman, but is traditionally worn by a man. And finally, in our contemporary collection, we'll be playing on the idea that will be very important throughout the museum in 2017, which is to think about how feminism, particularly second wave feminism, was problematic for and problematized with a lot of women of color. The ways in which the second wave feminist movement had a lot of issues and had a problem, white feminist culture, um, found itself often in conflict or in dialogue with um, women of color, and what does that mean? So we'll be reinstalling the contemporary collections in particular um, along the lens of, um, of, of women of color and feminism. Also, I'll just close by, oh, and this is also another Egyptian project we're doing. This is a, um, a site of an excavation of a temple of Mut, which is a, uh, who's a, a, a woman deity in the Egyptian, in the Egyptian culture. And it was largely, it's an excavation that the Brooklyn Museum has been participating in since the 1970s. And it's little known that the actual excavation site was originally really founded by two women um, who were not trained as archaeologists, but did a significant amount of work on the site before other places like the Brooklyn Museum came in and started working on it. So again, another example that ties in with feminist thinking, but also ties in with our own um, institutional history, which I think is a really um, fun thing to try and do. So the last slide is, not that one, that one, is an image of the front of the Brooklyn Museum during the Suzanne Lacey performance that I mentioned earlier. This is one of the things we did, which we had never done before, which was we have these steps, we have this modern facade on our building that has these steps that are set up as sort of a bleachers here. And we took the questions, some of the questions that had been part of the ongoing discussion in Suzanne Lacey's project, and we put them on the risers out in front of the institution to sort of really as you were driving down Eastern Parkway, you couldn't sort of miss this message in um, the idea of just questioning um, how feminism impacts on a place like this wonderful Beaux-Arts building in the heart of Brooklyn. I kind of am sorry about the way this, this, what's in it for the men, I'm not thrilled that that's in the metal, sort of highlighted here, but the way that it appeared on the risers, excuse me, was not quite so centralized. There it is, still a legitimate question. I'm done. <laughs> <laughs>
felt arbitrary was really important to us. And the way that we decided to deal with that was we decided to install the work, since for Judith Scott, the primary, the only motivation for her was the making. And what she would do is she would sit at a table, a folding table at Creative Growth, and just make her work. She was there every day, 9 to 5, and um, on a folding table. So we decided to sort of keep it, keep that as the sort of idea of what we did. So we didn't want to put them as high as that because we wanted people to sort of get a bit, be able to see them better. So we made those low platforms. And we, um, most, they don't have an up or a down, but a lot of them clearly have base sort of areas the way she worked on them. So we just installed them that way. So in that same sense of just trying to, I think one of the best things that a curator can often do is try and stay out of it as much as possible when you're dealing with objects. And um, that's what we tried to do. And I think that by extension, that's also Matthew's thinking about calling it sculpture. And because um, she never did. And I do. I don't have a problem calling it sculpture. But I think it's an interesting discussion when you're thinking about sort of what your options are with these, with, um, with an artist who, who really didn't have a voice. And in giving her a voice, so to speak, one of the worst things you can do is sort of put your own voice on top of it. And that was, I think, the goal was to largely just try not to do that. Because it's sort of, the, in fact, the opposite of what you're working towards for 2017 with the, multiplic the multiple labels. Right, that's true. You're reducing. You're not reducing, but you're subtracting it. No, it's true. And that's what was so interesting about, that's what I love about that show is it offered so many kind of push-pulls in terms of the way you can have that conversation. And that's why I love the idea of the fact that the personal is political is such a feminist kind of a great conversation. In the case of Judith Scott, maybe that's not the conversation. Yeah. So. Thank you. Um, I really like how you kind of began all this by saying that the mandate, or you understood the mandate as, as, as being to perform what you want or what we want rather than to protest what we don't want. That seems like a really kind of coming from a position of um, strength. And then you described um, what were feminist gestures. The one was challenge, uh, challenging the persistent order that tends to favor men, and the other was, um, I guess, being interested in, interested in the practice that is uh, more about self criticality versus self expression. So I think you could just kind of elaborate a little bit on self-criticality versus self-expression, what you mentioned. I think you can read it several different ways, but for me, one of the basic ways of reading it, and, you know, in spite of my saying, also opening by saying that I'm not particularly interested in your own self depth if you, about feminism, the fact is that the Sackler Center largely grows out of second wave feminism. We wouldn't be here without second wave feminism, and that's very important. Um, so that particular comment, I think, also really, for me, particularly resonates when I think about second wave feminism. When I think about second wave feminism coming of age in the emergence of conceptual art in response to, in reaction against that sort of entrenched um, sort of end game of modernism, which was minimalism, <laughs> Um, and complete abstraction and a complete removal of touch and a complete removal of sort of personal um, presence. That, I think, um, is part of what that comment is about, the idea of instead of, instead of the sort of self-expression of, even before minimalism, obviously, of abstract expressionism and as of sort of Greenbergian formalism, um, pushing against that with the idea of being self-referential, with it being self-aware, with being critical of a political social context is, um, I think, one of the things that drives most art making in our current world. Even if it's not primary, any artist is probably expected to talk about it, expected to be able to contextualize themselves and to talk about how they identify themselves, art historically, socially, all of those things. And I think that's part of what that means. Um, I believe Elizabeth Sackler is the first woman chair of the Board of Trustees. Yes. Uh, as of last spring. As of last spring. And I guess my question is, how much does her ongoing support of the museum and, of course, the sector um, feed into the plans for 2017? What do you mean by support? Money? <laughs> well, I mean both money, yeah. yes, 
and her ongoing presence mm -hmm. within the museum intersection? Yep. It's a good question. It's a complex question. Um, her support of the institution. So Elizabeth Sackler has been a member of the Board of Trustees for over 10 years. And as noted last spring, she became the first chair person of the board in the museum's history, first female in the, in the museum's history. So it's quite significant. We are also in the process of hiring a new director right now. And so interesting times ahead for the Brooklyn Museum, for sure. And her commitment, I think, is strong and ongoing. The next director's commitment is, of course, open to some degree, though I don't imagine that the board would hire somebody who didn't have an equal commitment to the project. I think the presence of the Sackler Center is very much, in my six years there, has become part and parcel of the way that everybody thinks, which is really fascinating. The number of conversations you have across curatorial departments that come back to ideas of feminism is quite extraordinary. Um, and for instance, the dinner party, if I get these statistics right, I'm really bad with statistics. Um, the dinner party is responsible, we understand, for an extraordinary percentage of the people who come to the museum to this day, still. So the numbers of people that come to see the dinner party in particular remains remarkably high. And so I think there's a very clear understanding within the institution of the value of what the Sackler Center has brought and what it can continue to bring. I think that these projects that I was talking about today and this sort of expansive vision about what we are within the institution at this point is being very much embraced. And I don't expect it to change, but, you know, it's um, there's a strong commitment at this point. Other questions, thoughts, things you hate? One. Um most of the artists that you've shown have been American, which makes sense, of course, even though the, the location and so forth. Um, you have mentioned others. I'm just wondering how, um, or if, in fact, this has been uh, something that's um, been worth real discussion, um, how that notion of the global um, is articulated at the museum in, in your planning and so on. Um, you know, given the kind of critique of the Anglo-American yeah. hegemony over uh, defining feminism. No, that's a really good question. And my answer a little bit also speaks to your question. And um, the Brooklyn Museum, I'm about to use this word, I'm sorry, brand, um, places the Brooklyn Museum in a position within the New York art community in a very particular way. One of the things that our director has prioritized and continues to prioritize is local communities and bringing in work and people from the local community so that there is a very strong push to multiple communities because obviously Brooklyn has one of the most sort of broadly diasporic um, groups, of groups of communities in the world. So we have a very strong commitment to sort of trying to balance the local while still maintaining a position on a, on a broader stage because of our size and our place. Um, having said that, it's interesting because the Sackler Center in some ways, and this goes, is unique in the Brooklyn Museum. There's a way in which I'm, everything I've said today has sort of been about the way that I want to be a part of the Brooklyn Museum, but there's also is definitely a way in which we are a little bit unique, and part of that is because the mandate of feminism does allow me to make arguments for shows like that Lucy Lepard show which would never appear typically somewhere else in the Brooklyn Museum. So the push for internationalism or the push for various voices is um, a very important part of almost all the conversations we have. It's interesting you should say that because part of the, sh you know, I didn't show you obviously all the shows we've done, but the ones that I picked out sort of spoke to specific things I wanted to talk about today, but I'm just sitting here thinking about different shows I could have shown that might have shown a broader sense of, of scope of, of types of people in different communities. But the Brooklyn Museum is largely seen as a local museum, and it's an interesting push to think about how you introduce um, larger context, unless you can point to a very specific local community. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that, that, that answers it, because it's, it's these overarching exhibitions Right. Global feminism. Global feminism is being an obvious example of very specifically trying to do that. Yeah, and, and, and really sh showing its 
limitations. But then even of our other shows, but we just did Ai Weiwei, we did Ellen at Sui, so we are, yeah, you can always do more. <laughs> Questions or thoughts? <coughs> Hi. So, building on your Lucy Lippert idea, have you ever considered doing an exhibit on the impact of wooden art criticism, uh, like mm -hmm. Barbara Rose and Pop Art, mm -hmm. and Lucy Lippert, and then Ray Watch and Leslie Krauss and Julia Kristeva? No, but that's interesting. And, and the first place I go, the first place, I'm sorry? Criticism and theory. Yeah, no, no, it's a good question. I mean, it's a great idea, in, except that the first thing that I think of, and anybody else who's a curator in this room, maybe you're a curator, it's the same, it's immediately think of the objects, you know, and one of the, I'm th one of the thing that's always interesting to me about ideas for exhibitions is um, what I think of as the difference between a sort of paper idea or a curatorial, what idea actually focuses and features objects. And that would be a hard show to pull off as, I think, an object-based exhibition. Um, I think you can maybe do it individually. I have thought the show of Lucy's, which one of the things that I, when I finally, when Vince and I finally convinced Lucy to do the show, one of the things she made us swear is that we would never call it the Lucy show, but we do. <laughs> she didn't even want her name in the title when we were working on it. Um, she wanted it to be about the art and the artists, but um, is um, was thinking about her as an example of somebody to define a, a historical moment, a sort of historical generation. So I have thought about that. So we did this. We did the seductive subversion show about pop art. We did the conceptual show. The next show that that would make sense in that lineage would be a show about the impact of feminism on pictures generation and on appropriation. There's been a lot of work. A lot of significant shows in the last couple of years done around that subject, so I have sort of been had my toe in that water for a while, but I'm not sure it's the right time to do that now. That would be a show that would take in a lot of theoretical writing because it is so much a that is the generation where theory and art really, I think, really did fully get into bed together, if you will. Um, but no, to answer your question simply. Yeah. Um, we haven't yet, and interestingly, the, the, uh, we have a very strong commitment to sort of um, web-based components we have for many years. The woman who's in charge of that at the museum, her name is Shelley Bernstein, and an interesting kind of twist lately, we have a very large grant from Bloomberg to work on what we're calling the Visitor Experience Initiative, and the way that we're now focusing on technology more than as a web-based experience is we're really focusing on how to productively use technology within the institution. So there's been a real shift in the institution that way. Only this week, I think, and next week, we're actually de demoing an app about how people can have a live interaction within the institution with a person to ask questions about, work of art, about works of art while they're standing in front of them. So we're focusing on the, our technological mojo that way right now. But but we are actually also, having said that, I know that they are talking about an overhaul of our website, which I guess is what's something that everybody's always having to do. Yeah. Yes. I, I don't know if I have a, a question as much as I do. Um, thank you for all the uh, work that goes into doing what you do. And one of the areas that I <clears throat> heard very loudly were the works within works. If you look at um, the sculpture, and I again, names and the others at the moment. Um, and also the community conversation where the women are in the streets. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I, I like the, the um, or what was pointed out strongly to me in that is the lack of amplification, ah. which again, the total correlation of women's voices. So what was seen actually is perhaps the story, which is feminist, the feminist movement, uh, the act of living uh, as a woman mm -hmm. in community still reigns, it's, there's a presence that's still happening. And the sculpture piece that of course was uh, sitting for 30 years um, and never, and the broken. The Chrysa piece, yep. Again, it's such a reflection of feminism. 
or Judas Scott, who was mute, exactly. <laughs> couldn't speak, so and then almost like works within works. That's interesting. The layering that's happening. Yeah. By bringing them out, we're actually seeing some of the present uh, activity. That's interesting. There's a great artist named Sharon Hayes. Some of you may know her work, and she does. She has this great piece where she found. She went back into 19th century and earlier um, sources and found mentions about women's voices and recorded people reading these. Th and inevitably, women's voices are sort of criticized, either for their tone or for the way that they spoke. And there's just always this way in which women's voices were undermined as authoritative, even in the writing about women speaking publicly. It's a really, really great work of art. I recommend Sharon Hayes. It was actually, that piece was shown at Carlton University Art Gallery. Here in Ottawa. Yay. Okay. Did I get that description right? I'm yeah. afraid I got it a little bit wrong, but <laughs> it's, it's a great work of art. But I think to an institutional level, the fact that the Sackler Center is in Brooklyn, just like WAC was at PS1, oh. and neither are in Manhattan on fifth, off Fifth Avenue where the MoMA is. So geographically, it's speaking to you know, the the distance between or where these voices are being heard or not heard. And I think that in itself is a really big statement, economically, geographically, and so forth. Except it's really hard to get people to leave Brooklyn and go into Manhattan these days. And vice versa. <laughs> but certainly with the WAC exhibition that happened in yeah. Long Island yeah. City, it was, well, why is this, it, you know, we're responding to the women artists who were protesting the MoMA 30 years prior, but now we're it's still in Queens, sort of. Or, or it's true, but I'll, I'll say one of the things that I think gives me a lot of free reign to do, I feel like gives me a lot of free reign to do the kind of shows that I talked about today is that I feel like I have so many great curatorial colleagues, and until recently a lot of them were at MoMA, who are doing really important shows. You can count and you know the number of really important monographic exhibitions devoted to women artists that places like MoMA are doing. Guggenheim still puts them in that secondary gallery, but, um, <laughs> or any other numbers of, of places. You look at Helen Molesworth now at MoCA, you look at Connie Butler at The Hammer, there's just the presence of women curators and people who are curating significant shows by women is, you know, the numbers, we can still crunch the numbers and they're probably abysmal, but it's heartening and I think it's important because it also, as I said, allows me to sort of not feel like, okay, what we have to do is monographic show after monographic show after monographic. Because I do feel like, you know, there's a lot of that being done. There's, right now in the galleries in New York, in Brooklyn and in Chelsea and in the Lower East Side, the number of really interesting shows up by women artists is extraordinary. So that's really nice to see. I definitely don't think feminist art has to be made by women. We did a great show. One of the sh slides we flipped through was by Matthew Buckingham, who did an amazing show for us on, on Mary Wollstonecraft, project he did on Mary Wollstonecraft. So, and that speaks to this idea that I mentioned before about gender fluidity. I think the fact that, again, this is a de center devoted to feminist art is much more current than is center devoted to women's art, because I do think the idea of what's male or what's female, it continues to morph and shift, and it should. So. The definition of feminist art, as I think was probably imagined when the center opened, had more to do with a moment in the 60s and 70s when the, there was an emergence of what was called feminist art, a feminist art movement that was defined that you could see, for instance, in the wax show that happened. So that's kind of the baseline for it. I don't, you know, one of the things that's interesting about artists today, especially younger artists, is that they identify in any numbers of ways, but they usually don't identify solely so feminism is a part of a practice. Feminism is a, an aspect of what somebody thinks about. So um, I think, don't think that's a bad, I think that's a really good question because it speaks to the fact that it's a really broad thing to talk about. So that's part of what my goal is, to talk about exactly what you asked. What does feminist art mean? What does feminist methodology mean? I focus more on the idea of methodology than I do of actually, does it, this is feminist, this isn't. You know, that's less interesting to me. that question and Jennifer's question before, 
would you define it as that that mode of self criticality? Is that the thing that you think of as being feminist? Like feminist or feminist art? Feminist art. See, I don't define feminist art. Is probably what it comes down to. I look for I look for a conversation about what feminism means within art, within makers. And that can really vary from object to object, from person to person to body of work. So I think my definition of feminism is something different. Okay. Um, you know, feminism per se is, is, is a political, social, cultural construct. It's not, you know, by definition, an art movement. That's part of what makes it interesting and part of what makes identity politics the things that we talk about in relationship to so many sort of groups of self-identifying opportunities. Um, so... In some ways, the Sackler Center for Feminist Art is the most problematic part of the title because it, for me, it's not so much about feminist art anymore. It's about <laughs> feminism as, as a tool, as a, as a lens. So it's, it's an interesting pushback for me in some ways. Do you, I mean, what do you think? Do you think that there's... Well, I mean, I guess I'm just like thinking about some of the feminist shows that I've seen. It seems to sort of value those ideas of like, the critical stance rather than the self-expression stance in feminism. And I, I just like talking about the conversation with Katie we had earlier, like I find that a generation of sort of like artists who define themselves as feminists now that I kind of place myself with mm -hmm. in, there is sort of a tendency towards like a self-expression where feminism is part of the dialogue, but it's not necessarily that like self-criticality on like a, anyway, it's a, it's a complicated. It's complicated. We, were, we had a studio visit earlier and one of the things that came up, which is really interesting to me, is an idea that, that a lot of, I think, interesting thinkers and curators that I know are, are sort of wondering about is how do you talk about, how do you talk about feminism in relationship to abstract painting, for instance? Mm -hmm. you know, and there are a lot of painters who would call themselves feminist that make abstract painting, and it's a really interesting, I mean, and sort of trying to find that in the work is sometimes useful and sometimes it's not, but it's an interesting conversation to have because um, it comes up a lot. So anyway, that's sort of a little bit of where that, I think our exchange comes from in some way. If there's one more question, and then we'll uh, just break to reception. <laughs> so is what you just said, your answer to why you won't or you don't like to do shows of all women artists? I don't think that doing a show of all women artists in and of itself is that much value added to something. I think that there's a reason for doing it that is beyond just the fact of gender. Then I would be interested in having the conversation. But I think the idea of a woman's show now doesn't feel particularly useful. Women just, oh, well, that's different. So you talk about, that's, and that's actually more about feminism. So if you wanted to talk about feminism in relationship to abstraction, you know, theoretically, you could also find, you know, a male painter who also considers himself a feminist or talks about gender issues in relationship to that. But that is an example of the more specific reason for having that conversation. So I think that's great. I mean, thank, so you. thank you very much for coming and for um, maybe this around. Thank you. I think uh, you've given us a lot to think about just in terms of different models, obviously like ranging from historical right through to contemporary and how such a focus center can work within a larger